Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session, Maintaining Asia's Internet Integration Across the World. My name is Wolfgang Lehmacher. I'm an operating partner at Anchor Group, a Swiss-based uh, corporate development and investment firm. Uh, the topic is highly relevant, and uh, we have an extremely... Uh, uh, talented and, and insightful group of, of speakers um, that will help us to understand all the dimensions of this topic, which I thought was uh, pretty straightforward when I received the invitation, but we will see. So I'm helped by Jerry Power, founder i3 Systems, uh, Daniel Thiel, Chief Executive Officer, Data Logical Services, Christoph Stuckelberger, founder and president, Globethics.net Foundation, and Daniel Zaretsky, co-founder, University of the Future. Um, the topic is a hot topic. Uh, some people may not know, but uh, the Internet is not something we can take for granted. Uh, countries have started to use that as a tool to exercise and execute their power by, uh, for example, stopping it from time to time, slowing it down, um, or doing other things which have significant impact uh, on, other, on the operations of companies and therefore other countries. Um, one can imagine that if one is dependent on the data from one country and this data suddenly is not available anymore, that creates uh, some kind of challenges. This happened a few days ago with AIS data, which China uh, stopped. So it's uh, real. And yesterday, Alex Capri, research fellow at the Hinrich Foundation, lecturer at the National University of Singapore, uh, wrote in a post, today, the U.S. placed 12 Chinese Chinese quantum computing groups on the restricted entity list. This was a predictable development given the potential for quantum technology to dramatically influence the world's geopolitical, economic, and security-related status quo. Everything is now open to massive, unimaginable disruption. So that's all related to our topic. So the Internet as the secret tool, but also weapon of the future. And I would like to invite now Jerry, Jerry Power, to give us his view on the topic and, and what are his thoughts and, and potential recommendations. So I think it's, it's clear that progress is made through collaboration by people uh, interacting with each other. And the larger the network, the more interactions, the more you can do collaboratively. I think that that's, that's a fairly proven statement. Um, so when people do go to shut down the internet or take actions like that, um, I think it's understood that they are in some, they are certainly impairing their own community in some respects, um, but it's also having a detrimental impact to the to the world at large, so I think when they take those those actions, they're doing so knowing that um, they're causing some harm, but they're trying to avert perhaps what they perceive as a larger harm within their country. Um, I think that's an issue um, that's not easily dealt with, um, and and I think it's a real concern because there's no real way for how do you remedy that? How do you take take into account um, the situations they're trying to deal with without impacting everybody else. It's, it's a done as a community issue. Is it uh, possible to uh, include that in multilateral trade agreements and treaties? Jerry, do you think that's a way? Um, I, th I think that there's something is needed um, because when somebody does take a portion of the internet offline, it impacts the rest of the global community. So there are um, detrimental impacts. Um, I think because it is a negative impact even to their own country, they're doing it because they don't feel that they have an alternative around it. Um, certainly, 
Um, you look at some of the privacy laws that have been done where you can't move data between countries. Part of that is because if you move the data outside the country, um, that country feels like they've lost the ability to protect their citizens because they have no one to turn to to try and, and, and address grievances. So I think something needs to be done, whether it's a multi how it's done, I don't know, but it's something that is needs attention and it's really in its early infancy even thinking about it. Thank you, Jerry. Daniel, you are dealing with the future, university of the future. You, so you are thinking a lot about how, how the future will look like, how it can be constructed. Uh, the internet in whatever shape and form is, a, is definitely a part of the future. A lot of people are now talking about the metaverse, right? So what if we create another world in the metaverse and suddenly that world uh, is slowed down? or pulled down, right? What, what happens to that economy? So what are your thoughts uh, about the topic? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Wolfgang. Um, so I'm, I'm home in New York currently, but uh, normally working in Central Asian countries in the, in the former Soviet Union. So I'm kind of have an interesting vantage point as, as an American who is kind of in a, in a region that, uh, China and Russia and the U.S., let's say, uh, to some extent, uh, buy for power. And, um, you know, I should say that a lot of some of these issues already that you have talked about, uh, both of you, uh, have, have come up. For example, uh, these countries are all, most of them in one guise or another, are trying to do various digital government and safe cities projects and, and, and the like. And they have a lot of issues that are very unresolved and that a lot of countries and societies are facing because um, they don't have generally the indigenous technology to do these projects. So they're generally going to be looking to Chinese technology slash company or a Russian technology uh, slash company to do this. And, you know, these projects have things like uh, facial recognition, storage of biometric data, pervasive cameras, uh, blocking sites and communication platforms, which you talked about. This is something that happens in the region. Uh, and, you know, you don't necessarily know in advance when that's, when that's going to happen. So it makes it hard to do business. Um, banning of VPNs, um, using, for example, Chinese apps for transactions, uh, business transactions. Um, so then there's also, uh, you know, issues of copy laws and so on, misinformation. Man, the Kazakhstan had a problem on recent misinformation, but um, data privacy, same thing. There have been breaches, um, the security breaches. Also, these are very landlocked countries. So the cables go through, you know, a China and a Russia. Uh, and, um, you know, who sets the rules, for example, China and Russia or the U.S. maybe will have more influence in international organizations than these countries themselves. And what this, what are some of the problems then is um, uh, the countries are going into debt by uh, taking on these projects. There's a big rural uh, uh, urban divide in terms of access to the Internet, in terms of electricity. All these countries have electricity problems in the winter. And in fact, now Kazakhstan, which is by far the most advanced country in the region, is, 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 is in the process of, of cutting back on crypto. My, a lot of Chinese companies came to Kazakhstan to do crypto uh, mining and all this kind of stuff. And it's destroying the electricity availability uh, uh, and so on. So um, one of the big issues then, for example, in Kazakhstan is they're using a, a Russian firm now. So um, Kazakhstan is, is, is always ahead in the region in many respects, including in digital government. And I'll, I'll just be two more minutes here. So Kazakhstan um, is doing a digital government. Uh, and right now, you know, each ministry has their own legacy systems. They've all been doing them separately. And um, each ministry has a deputy minister who has KPIs, uh, <laughs> who is responsible for digitizing the ministry. So now they're trying to come up with one system for the whole digital government platform, and they're using a Russian firm. And the controversy is this. These countries do not have capable indigenous IT to do this, but 
Kazakhstan does to some degree. It's the only one. So why is Kazakhstan not using Kazakhstan firms to do these projects? They're using a Russian firm. Um, and then the question, of course, when you deal with Russia and China is, well, what is the government and what is a private firm? How do we know that one isn't really an arm of the other? Uh, Russia will share the uh, source code. Um, so I guess the other thing is, is the last issue there is, you know, none of this is up for public discussion in any of these countries or transparency. The public doesn't get a voice in deciding anything about these projects. Uh, and then so you have a question is how much do, do the Central Asian countries, how much power do they really have? How much do their citizens have? How much power do their citizens have? Where will the data be stored? Who has access to it? And for example, just recently, Kazakhstan said that, uh, you know, some of the major American companies, I think the Googles and the Facebooks, this is my last point, had agreed, had agreed to store their data in Kazakhstan. And they, they put this on Twitter or somewhere in public. And the American companies said, no, we never agreed to that. So that's a current issue too right now, and all countries are, are trying to force that as well. So just to recap, the, the, it's a very interesting thing geopolitically, uh, and it's also a thing that I think a lot of uh, developing countries will, you know, will be facing that, that want to do these projects that don't necessarily have the indigenous capacity to do them or may, but uh, how, how do they decide to do this? Do they, how do they involve the public? Uh, who do they go with? How do they allow the data? There are a whole host of issues just in Central Asia that probably most of the world are facing. So I think I can stop there and, uh, you know, I'm happy to talk more about it further. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, a wealth of information and uh, a lot of food for thought, uh, which uh, I would love to go come back to, but uh, in the interest of time, I would like to give... Uh, the world to, to Danny. And Danny, um, maintaining integration, that sounds a bit strange to me, in particular when I listen to, to uh, Daniel, right? He, he is, in fact, saying there is a world that is emerging that is maybe more integrated but should not be that integrated that easily. Um, so... What is your take on maintaining integration and the whole topic, maintaining integration of, of Asia into the world? Should that happen? Is that happening? Is that, is that the case? Will it happen? Your thoughts? I mean, it can be if it's posed as a thought around which we make contributions. But I think it's, it's nations in particular are anachronistic because I think – in rephrasing the original question, I want to say, how can we be assured of global communications while maintaining a people's privilege to control messaging and destructure this whole thing? Because if I listen, if I uh, respond to each one of these symptoms of what seems to me like rabies, you know, one symptom comes up, you treat it. Next symptom comes up, you treat it. It's like trying to put out a grass fire. Every time, you know, you've got a flame, you've got another spark lighting it over here. And I've chosen to, well, <clears throat> ignore it, right? And look for a, a different solution. And this is really a four-step solution the way I see it. I'm going to describe very briefly in my three minutes what the situation is, what my proposed solution is, how it can be applied and what are the provisions of it? And I touched on this last time. So I've written it down, and I want to read from it. This is unlike me because I usually like to, to you know, shoot from the hip, being a cowboy and all. So here's the way I see it. First of all, I think it's important to know that I've got 150,000 data scientists working for me and with me around the globe. And I'll get to that and how I'm going to implement that and what how we will provide a solution outside of trying to solve the current problem, which I think is really unsolvable. It's kind of a Humpty Dumpty issue here. So I'll begin. I think the solution is in algorithmic governance, which replaces the paradigm of 
intersubjective expectations. Intersubjective expectations is also known as trust in a fractured world. So I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to restructure trust um, by or through technological intermediaries as an authoritative algorithmic phenomenon of governance, a different kind of law as the new authority, which we can do as data scientists, right? We write the code. Then with data scientists, we'll build the code that becomes part of a social fabric that supports that is that is supported through the mediation with people, which is known as money, with a new money, which is called cryptocurrency, that more easily becomes the truest motivational measure of value without relying on fiat currency. And then fourth, we're going to do that through the establishment of a DAO, a DAO. Um, which is a decentralized autonomous organization, not as it was when it failed with the DAO, but as it is now, it provides uh, financial pooling, decentralization, autonomy, and organizational structure to run an economy that can afford, uh, can avoid the global institutional stranglehold of entrenched infrastructures. I tried to go slow enough so that it makes some sense. But that's what we're fighting, you know, because if you start succeeding and you don't loot the big boys, somebody's going to cut you off at the knees, right? So we're going to start small. We're going to put together this DAO. And through the DAO, we're going to take this fractionalization, which has happened already on the planet, and the destruction of trust. Because I don't know these people. They don't know me. And I have no reason to trust them. So we'll do it through an algorithmic uh, governance and through um, change management and establishing uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency as a new measure of uh, social communication through DAOs, through a DAO. And by the way, we have uh, our DAO is going to be called Dao De Ching. Which I think, of course, is, you know, the righteous way forward. Let we me, have the uh, name already. Thanks. We're pretty sure thanks, about that. Thanks, thanks a lot. Dow gives the impression we are talking organizations. Uh, where, where, where is the government in all that? Through code. Code is law. And if we're, as, as data scientists and developers, write the code, then the code is what you must follow. And that code can be embedded in the system It can also be changed. It's flexible. It can be responsive, but only through um, the developers who establish it. Right. So it's like it's like blockchain. It's immutable. And at once you record it, then you've. Well, managed not only the communication between everything, which is what blockchain does. You can track, you can manage, you can manipulate nearly everything. And then you give. um Governance by which is, of course, the alignment of visions and strategies to accomplish a positive production and sustainable change through accessing multiple options, limitations and opportunities. Right. And I think once we sew all of that together, which we're doing quite well in doing already, then we'll have a system which principally ignores the other one, like most governments around the planet, which are examples of failure. And I don't want to fix them because I, they're not they're not able to be fixed. We need something new. We need something fresh and something which works from the bottom up and not from Thank the top you, down. Thank you, Danny. Christoph, how how are your reactions to what you have heard and what uh, were your thoughts when you when you learned about the topic? Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> Maybe just uh, briefly about my background. I'm sitting here in Geneva uh, in the midst of the UN agencies, UN Geneva, ITU, uh, WIPO, uh, ILO, WHO, all these regulatory bodies. 
And the question is, of course, now, is that meaningless because of this split of the world into regions, into boxes uh, in, in Asia, but across the world? Or do we have a kind of global governance structures which allow us to have the internet integration in a structured way? So um, I think... Uh, Coming back to the to uh, reacting to the uh, previous speaker, Danny, I think the I would I would suggest human centered is the key issue now. What is we have to place the human beings, you and me, from flesh and blood and brain in the center. And uh, we discuss always about technology. And of course, technology is beautiful and we all depend on it. This um, discussion could not happen without it. So I'm uh, absolutely in favor of technology. But under the condition that we say the human first. And uh, we even need to come to a point where we say, in case the whole technology is breaking down or breaking up or dominating, enslaving us, enabling us, let's be come back to the basics. You are a human being. I'm a human being. We want a direct communication. And if all technologies leave us, I still I cannot see you because the Internet is down, but I still can embrace my wife and can meet my people in the home, in the street. Uh, so let's come back to basics. Uh, and I think that is also this basics is the, the basic challenge. As an ethicist and uh, a theological ethicist uh, by, by background, I mean, we all know that we have the, still the old Adam, as we would call it. We are still humans with all the ambiguity of being able to do good, but at the same time able to do destructive work. And this is the reality, and we have to start from this reality and accept it in order to overcome it, to improve human behavior. And all technology is just a mirror of this fact that we are ambiguous, that we can do good and bad. And each new technology... We always think the new technology is the solution. No, the new human being is the solution. And as long as we are the old human being, uh, the new technology will be the old technology with this ambivalence. And that's why I also am not sure that algorithmic governance and these kind of things are the solution. Of course, it can help. I'm not at all against it, but it's not now the Deus Ex Machina the solution coming now from the machine. I just had another panel in another disc uh, on, on algorithm, AI and ethics. And uh, the mistrust uh, in algorithms will even increase dramatically. So how to, uh, um, to create trust between humans with the help of technology, but also with putting the technology in its corner or its right place. Now, what does it mean briefly? I think we need a balance. I published uh, during COVID last year, a 600 page book with a title Globe Balance, an ethics handbook for a post COVID world. What do I mean? We need the balance between freedom, free access to everybody, uh, to everything and uh, governance and structure. We need the the balance between central control and decentralized freedom, uh, and so on and so on. So we would be blind if we say we go back to the uh, 20 years of the golden age of globalization, where the economists or the, the business people told us no governance, no politics needed, we uh, drive the world a free ride for everybody, everywhere, and then we had the paradise. And then the 2008 collapse, um, politics comes back, has to regulate. We need to balance between this freedom of markets and internet and, uh, and the governance structures. And now we are in the new uh, phase of uh, arms race uh, back. Cyber is an arms race top level, 
the drones and whatever we can imagine, even not yet imagine, and the you quoted quantum uh, war is a it is a is a is an arms race issue. Those who have the say on the quantum computing, and we are here in Basel in Switzerland, also have a quantum uh, center. Um, those who have the say in quantum have the say on the the arms of the future. And, and uh, this is where we need this balancing, and uh, that means uh, coming back to the fundamentals of being and respecting each other and look at each other's eyes and say, look, you're a human, I'm a human, we both want to live and we want to cooperate in order to survive. I, I think it's interesting that we're sort of talking almost two extremes here as being possible solutions. One of them being sort of to accept that, well, I mean, it's clear that trust has been devolving over time. I mean, we've been losing trust in institutions in each other across the board. Um, it seems like one of the solutions might be, well, less trust in algorithmic processes rather than in people, um, which, which is really, I don't think that's really about building trust. It's about learning how to e evolve, how to exist, how to cooperate in a world where trust it no longer exists, or the other alternative is like, how do we find ways to build trust between parties um, so that we can do things? And I, and I think those are very extreme and very different positions. Yeah, it is interesting what Christoph is saying. Um, and, and I think everybody has mixed feelings hearing that. Um, <laughs> because some people say we haven't... Um, achieved in millions of years of ev evolution to build trust between each other, maybe we should give a chance to the machines, right? So, and that's, that's where, where Danny is kind of coming, coming from and so, say, okay, let's, let's build a code. But, but interesting, but, yeah, Jerry. I, I, I would challenge that. I think we have been building trust for periods of time. Um, I, I mean, I think the, the Dark Ages is an example of where we moved back away from trusting in, in each other. Um, but since then, we have sort of generally been moving forward, um, <laughs> stepping back on occasion, and then hopefully we step forward again. One thing I've sort of wondered about is whether the crisis we're facing in trust now has really been brought about by the anonymity of the Internet. I mean, when people can sort of say and do what they want and their identity is masked so that they can't be held accountable for their what they've said, what they've done, I, I think in some ways that emboldens people to take um, counterproductive action, the things that are not necessarily good for society. Yeah, yeah how is that, that linked to integration, to our topic? How is that linked to to the U.S.-China situation as we as we see that today. So I and, and I don't quite honestly know the answer. It, it, I don't think it's been explored. It hasn't been discussed enough. But if you if if China had issues with a specific person's opinion, or they thought that because this question of what is misinformation is in the eye of the beholder. So I'm assuming that somebody says something and China says something else. Maybe they disagree on what real is. But if you can track it back and say, here's the real root cause of, of that feeling to a person, to a sector, and you could stop that one person or slow them down, then instead of having to shut off all of Google or instead of having to shut off all of Facebook, you could more target your responses instead of shutting it all down at once, which which has a lot of has a lot of hurts the good with the bad. Jerry, I like your I like your uh, say description that we had moments of higher trust and <clears throat> moments of lower trust, right? Because that that's the the reality. There was not always, there is not mistrust between all people. There has not been mistrust amongst all nations. There, there has been moment of, of high trust, high solidarity. Uh, but uh, currently we are, we are not in that situation. We are in a situation where, where there is a lot of maneuvering. Um, and Christoph touched upon certain, certain elements. Uh, trust is fundamental. Trust is is the foundation. How how can we get back, Christoph, to to a more 
uh, a world more built on trust and more more open communication and and joint effort, uh, or do you see even the rivalry uh, and the current situation as kind of fruitful in the long term? Yeah, thank you. I think the the key is really that we rediscover our capacity as human beings of direct encounter. I think we all are fed up with this COVID situation. We are Zoom tired. We are uh, around the world tired. Uh, we want to meet people face by face. And I think we need to rediscover the emotional capacities that we have to connect, to have compassion, to have empathy. And young people who are uh, so much, hours and hours every day, in this mix of virtual and, and real world, we are, and they have difficulties, really, mental and emotional difficulties to distinguish what is what. This is a big uh, t- topic uh, or challenge. So just to come back to basics, uh, and to uh, redevelop empathy, and I'm not a, a social r- romanticist, not, not at all, but I would say if we come back to that, and if we look at world history, I mean, Gorbachev and Reagan, they looked into their eyes directly, and Joe Biden and she have to do that face to face. And then the 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 it does not solve the problem of course we have power relations but we need this and then we need the people i remember i mean all these women movements in south america where women said we build communities of women we resist we are human beings from woman to woman from man to man and i think this is my plea in terms of we as people we have to go back and say, this is my friend. I have my friend in Russia. I have my uh, friend in Kazakhstan. And I want to keep that friendship. And I do all I can in order not to break this friendship because it, this friendship is more important than uh, something else in my life. Yeah, Christoph, I... I personally have to feel, Danny, I I come immediately to you. You were next on the list. Um, uh, This this situation of friendship was never as strong as today, I think, because we come out of a period of mass travel. The Internet has connected us in a way we have never been connected before. But at the same time, I got the feel that we got very disconnected to our own govern- governments. So what we wish to to maintain and, and further develop is maybe not fully in line with what the governments want us to do or what, what with their plans. But that comes to my mind. Danny. <clears throat> I try not to get involved in admonitions, which is principally telling people what to do without telling them how to do it. It's a failure. And I think that when you're talking about trust, once it's broken, it can never be restored, ever. It's gone. At least in my life, I see things that way. Um, And I'm glad you brought up Biden because I think Biden is the perfect example of a DAO, which is no central leadership, so that you can consider the United States as a DAO. And then I look at countries like China, where you got Xi, where Putin, right? And my first successful happy idiot, they called me, um, venture in Russia and buying real estate was when I said to the guy, I don't know you, right? I don't know what you're doing. I don't know whether or not you're going to give my money back. So I'm going to ask you on your honor, if this deal doesn't come through, you give me 10% plus of what I put in. And he did it. So, you know, you, you, you put the person on the line and it becomes a, a matter of their own personal honor, which happened to work in that situation. But I see like Columbine, this mass murder, you know, of students uh, in, in Colorado, I think it was years ago. People, these people believed in things that were made simple for them, which was provided by Adolf Hitler, 
which is provided by Stalin. I mean, you can pick the world's worst people, but they make things clear. And it's easy to follow things that are clear. When I listen to Biden, it's like nothing is clear. You know, he I don't know who he is. I don't know what he stands for. Nothing. I want things to be clear. And if I can simplify them in a way in which I can take action on something, then I believe, you know, I'm headed in a good direction. And honor and trust and belief, I don't believe, I want to know, which is a Buddhist phenomenon, right? And the one thing I'll close with saying is I like Buddha's words as to the purpose of Buddhism itself, which is to avoid at all costs argumentation. Because it doesn't solve anything. You just say what you're going to do and you do it. Follow through with your words. That's all you have to do. Even if it means you lose something because you fell short. Okay, well, what are you going to do? That's what happened to the first Dow. They lost 78 million. They got it back. Okay, because people principally are testing systems. I want it clear. That's why I'm going, you know, to, 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 to programmers and developers. Write the code. That's clear. Daniel, you raised your hand. Yeah, you know, I wanted to just say about the, the regional integration. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that China has their own Internet system and the rest of the world has their, their own system. But I want to I wanna push back on something about is it so great that we're all been connected like this? My whole life, hmm. I'm saying, yes, this is great. That it's, I mean, I can call anybody, I can call somebody on the moon in two seconds now. You know, I grew up in the Cold War. Can you imagine? Uh, right? But I'm thinking, yes, we're all humans. Yes, we all have a lot of commonalities. But this is the first time in history where we're putting so many different various cultures together and they're interacting with each other. And they have a lot of different ways of looking at things. Yes, all humans are the same in how they show emotions, smiles. But they look at things differently, like patriarchy, like collective, you know, all the different values, like time management, like this and that. And I know this being an American working in a radically different culture in Central Asia. So I'm wondering if all this is actually decreasing trust. If all of this stuff that we're doing, that I can be connected with a Chinese and a Central Asian and a Russian and a, and a Malian and a this and that, I mean, it's so radically different cultures, and some of them are very traditional, all of a sudden being thrown into the modern world and interacting with each other and having different value systems and all that. And I'm just wondering then if that is – because to me, I've noticed that this trust has been just completely decreased in the last 20 years, ever since this Internet started. It's all started, you know, to me – I don't know that it's the same thing, but when I look back and I see when I was growing up as opposed to now – it's with the internet that all this stuff started. So I'm starting to wonder now, how great is this really? And how great is this, you know, and I was an anthropology major undergrad, so I'm all into cultures and mixing and, and understanding each other. But are we really understanding? Are we really, or are we decreasing and getting less and less trust by being more in touch with each other um, and so on? It's just an interesting thought. Yeah, Daniel, thank, thanks for that thought. Uh, as somebody who, who, who believes in exchange and connection, it's, it's a bit of a, a bitter pill to, to reflect on. The same, uh, the same yes. Um, but I would like to ask Christoph whether, whether this could be an intermediate step because isolation, isolation can also not be there or disintegration, decoupling, all this what we hear, right? can also not be the solution. I, I, I think that that will lead us uh, to more conflict. And, and we see that, that the security risk is increasing probably by the hour. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think it's again a question of balance between too much and too little. The prejudice uh, um, psychology, they showed that uh, for example, tourists, travelers around the world do not decrease their prejudices, but increase if it's just a superficial travel. So right. travel by as such is not increasing uh, peace uh, per se. So that's uh, in that sense, I think I, I agree with Daniel. Um, and in that sense, 
we cannot say automatically a connected world is a better world and a more peaceful world. No. But on the other hand, we need this connectivity. So I think we should educate ourselves and our people to say, let's have the good balance. We need connectivity. It is essential. And what we do now here is, is so meaningful. And at the same time, don't exaggerate. We also need our protected small communities, our families, um, um, state, uh, nation state, where we say, I don't care about the rest of the world. I care now for that, for that moment. I even now, uh, 20 years ago already, I played for um, periods of um, internet abstention. We switch off. We say we go on holiday or we have an internet-free week or an internet-free day or an internet-free month in order to resource ourselves. And I think what you said from the Buddhist background uh, echoes in me on that. So we need this resourcing and to say we are not slaves of the internet. We are not forced to, to communicate to everybody anytime, day and night, no. Between 12 and 6 in the morning, I sleep. I don't take the call from the U.S. or from Asia. I sleep. I have my islands where I protect my communication. And I think then we can have the, the balance between the benefits and to avoid the harm. Thank you, Christoph. That brings us to the last round and uh, you, you kicked it off. Jerry, what is your thinking uh, now? What is to be done to reach that healthy integration and wherever the, the, the cursor will or should land on the spectrum? So I, I think we're at an interesting point in time in, in that we could sort of accept that trust is going to continue to evaporate and that we will effectively enter um, a, a digital form of the dark ages um, or we can sort of understand that we have to sort of use the fact that we can communicate, but we have to take it to the next step and use find ways to use that communication to build trust between each other. Um, so that, and, and, and if, or find out who we don't want to trust um, so that we are actually moving more instead of uh, a dark ages to an age of enlightenment. And I think a lot of the things that we're talking about here are like front and center to that conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. I, I have some, I, I didn't see that somebody raised their hand. Barry Lustig, I hope, I don't know, Barry, whether you're still with us. Um, but uh, if yes, then uh, please raise your, your voice. I hope that I know how to give you the mic. <laughs> Barry? No. Oh. Myself out. I don't know that you have to do anything. I maybe he just has to. Yeah. Okay. I, um, yeah. I need to educate myself here to, <laughs> to navigate better the, the integrated world. Uh, very quickly, Daniel. In a few words, uh, what what should be done? Your vision for an integrated world. Um, I, I'm not sure that there's an easy answer. Uh, are, are we moving forward that governments control this? Are we, are we moving forward that governments don't control this? I mean, I think that's right there. And just the last thing is, you know, uh, libertarians like to be against the government. I understand that. But what about uh, the private sector or big tech as well? They, they can be just as controlling as the government. We don't hear from them on that. So I think there's a big issue. Who controls the rules that we make? Yeah, thank you, Daniel. That's a, a good, um, I think, a good starting point for Daniel because there are some people who think that the governments anyway are not controlling the space we have debated, that this is, uh, in the meantime, the space of big big tech, which is not regulated by governments. So, Danny, what is your, you have the final word. word. Oh, well. <laughs> well, I've never known government to get anything right because I right. don't think it's their job, right? Government should be like a, a contractor. And the work that is to be done 
is to be done by the public, not by the government, right? And I think they've proven that time and time again. So I, I want them out of the room. I just I, I don't want to give them any more chances. And that's why I think starting small with what a- anonymity, with decentralization, anything to, to break the back of uh, politics, right? Whether, whether they're controlling what they call a pandemic. Suddenly last year we have no more cases of, in, of influenza. What happened? Well, they included them all in COVID, right? I don't trust these people. I don't want to trust these people. I don't want to make the effort to trust these people. It's like, go away. Xi, go away. Biden, go away. Putin, go away. The list is endless, you know? And Because look at it. Did, did Hillary Clinton ever receive any justice? Of course not. The whole system is corrupt. I'm not going to put any trust into it anymore. I want to start my own small groups of people, write code, and eventually control the world myself, which I think I could do a better job than anybody else that I that I see, you know, on TV or, or whatever. Okay, Danny. Um, no, I, I, I need to give the last word to Christoph because with that smile, uh, I need a bit of a counterbalance here to close up the discussion. Christoph, <laughs> I, what is your take on Danny's? No, I mean... Uh, to be honest, I uh, I totally disagree with Danny. Uh, this is uh, a kind of uh, view which I could never share. We need governments. We need strong governments. We need regulations. And within that, that allows only the freedom of the individual to act. Otherwise, we are in the wild west and, and wild south and wild north, wherever you, you, you do it. So how... T- and... Uh, I could never say also, I do not trust and I will never trust. That's not the the answer. It's how to rebuild trust step by step. And trust is not just a curve like that or like that. Trust is a constant movement uh, of redoing it. Like we need to feed our, our, our stomach daily, we need to re feed our trust reservoir. It's not just here or not here. And I think we th- this this panel is, is one little element, uh, regional integration, local integration, disintegration where needed, um, even stepping uh, down. For example, I, I'm honest, I, I have uh, deep insights into China, into America, into Africa, but I have difficulties with the uh, Middle East, Arab world. I was there many times, but I don't feel the, the, the match somehow. I accept I'm not a specialist. I'm not um, matching with the Arab world, so I don't need. Uh, I, I have enough other things to do. So this kind of balancing and rebuild trust day by day, I think, is what I would uh, hope that we can do. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Thank you, Jerry, Daniel, Danny, Christoph. Uh, very, very insightful discussion. And uh, yeah, hope to continue uh, at another RASIS meeting. And I wish you a good continuation. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye-bye. You, so thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.